So it's my privilege today to welcome James Millward, who is Professor of Intersocietal History at the Walsh School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University, where he teaches Chinese history, Central Asian history, as well as world history. And Jim is, without a doubt, the leading historian of Xinjiang, a part of China that has been in the news a great deal lately. And it's also fair to say that Jim is one of the most prominent public intellectuals when it comes to discussions of that particular part of China. The first question that I wanted to pose for you, Jim, is to what extent do you see the current situation in Xinjiang as a legacy of the Qing Empire? All right, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Micah, for uh, inviting me to be on this webinar series and to talk about this, about this topic. And it's good to see you again. You didn't mention that you were my colleague at Georgetown at one <laughs> that is universities true, yeah. ago, but yeah. it's, it's great to see, to see you. Um, yeah, so I started out, you know, as a, as a Qing historian, I guess I still am, um, to a certain extent. And what I was studying when I wrote Beyond the Pass was how Xinjiang was integrated, was part of the, of the Qing Empire. And, uh, I, I take, I like to use the word Qing Empire rather than Qing Dynasty, because that emphasizes its its nature as, as an empire like other Eurasian empires, and also as it emphasizes the territories beyond what we call China proper or the former you know, Ming, Ming territories. Um, and as I'm sure many of the, the viewers of this will know, the uh, school of, of Qing history, if it is a school um, or the sort of approach, which is known as new Qing history, um, but one of its points was that the Qing is an empire like this, and it had other components, other places, other peoples beyond simply China. So if we call it the Qing dynasty, it seems like yet another iteration of this kind of ahistorically repeating you know, metaphysical quantity of China. Uh, you know, other places have kingdoms and empires, and China just has dynasties, it's just kind of repeating. And I don't like that, uh, that approach, and I'm sort of moving more and more away from that. Um, uh, but so anyway, so all of this was emerging when I was looking at Xinjiang and figuring out how to talk about it and how to talk about it as part of the part of the of the Qing. And uh, the approach that I ended up with and what I learned from this process, reading the the Qing's own archival record of of the conquest and the management and the running of Xinjiang, uh, was that it was an imperial territory, absolutely. And it was quite closely controlled by, by Beijing. It wasn't you know, a tributary. Sometimes it gets confused with this idea of the tributary system. Uh, but it was not a colonial territory, at least not initially, at least not, not all of it. By which I mean, quite pointedly, the, the Qing rulers kept Chinese settlers out. There were some merchants going in and, in and out and so on. But they, they were, besides some farms in the east and the north, the main Uyghur, what is now where the people we now call Uyghurs live, uh, the Qing kept Chinese out of there and wanted to, and because they realized it would cause a problem. And they also ruled with a pretty light hand, particularly in cultural matters, uh, you know, cultural laissez-faire. They didn't try to Sinicize. They didn't really try to Confucianize for that first century, so from the mid-18th through the mid 19th century. Uh, and that's important because it sets a, a, a model which I've called in some of my writings uh, Im imperial pluralism or centralized pluralism. And that's not pluralism, obviously, in the sense of democratic societies are pluralistic, but it is a recognition of cultural uh, diversity, to use our you know, terminology we talk about today. Uh, and it's actually very, very common in old world empires, too. From the, from the ancient Persian empires and even to a certain extent parts of the Roman Empire and, 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 and others and even even early modern 
iterations of the European empires, so the earlier stages of British and French. This is actually very relevant when we talk about the PRC and even problems now, I think, because what we saw, what, what you see after 1949 uh, through the 50s, really right up to the Cultural Revolution, is a, a new way of creating that kind of imperial pluralism or call it centralized pluralism. It's similar to the system of the Soviet Union. And of course, the Soviet Union had a very similar, similar sort of problem of an ancien regime, which was an old empire, and then a socialist communist state was taking it over. And, and part of the ideology and traction of socialism was that it was anti-imperialistic, right? Almost by definition. So how do you run an empire when you're ideologically anti-empire? So you get unions of, soci of, of Soviet socialist republics, right? Uh, in the Chinese case, they didn't make Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet uh, into republics. They were very resistant about that idea. But uh, they did have various types of autonomy, various types of special allocation of, of sovereignty, at least in theory, the idea of the, the 56 Minzu being, being celebrated and identified you know, for all the ways in which that's top down and, and often artificial, it does show an attempt by the communist state to have a kind of pluralistic approach to the diversity that was very evident in the territories that they had taken over from the former, from the former, former chain. Uh, and maybe I'm getting a little ahead of the conversation here, but uh, what we've seen in the last few years has been the, the, the PRC, the Chinese Communist Party, turning away from its initial pluralistic approach of celebrating Minzu, of at least on paper, honoring uh, parts of the idea of autonomy and special zones and so on, uh, to, to be trying to integrate these places much more closely and also with a much heavier assimilative hand in, in policies applying to Uyghur culture, um, mm -hmm. Tibetan culture for that matter, and even, you know, even Hong Kong. Right, so this actually leads me to another question that I was curious to ask, and that is, what do you see as the most appropriate time frame for what has been happening in Xinjiang over the past several years, namely this move towards assimilation, or if you want to use a term that New Qing historians like yourself have roundly criticized, Sinicization in Xinjiang. Do you think that the origins go back to, for example, the Urumqi riots in 2009? Do you think that they're connected to a global war on terror? Or do you push it back to an earlier date or place it in a more recent time frame. Yeah, so I'm going to, uh, I guess, punt on the question a little bit and, and say all of the above, mm -hmm. and kind of explain why they're all they're all relevant. Um, I've just finished this summer. I w worked on a new chapter for another book of mine, Eurasian Crossroads, which is a general history of the Xinjiang region, and I, I finished the first edition in 2005. So obviously, a lot has happened in the last 15 years, and I just had to write a new, you know, this new chapter to update it for the second edition that's coming out pretty soon. And that made me have to think about precisely this question that you asked and, and what has these last 15 years where things have really gotten so much worse, particularly in the last four or five years, you know, how are they connected to uh, times past? And I guess the, the first date that I would, I would begin with, I really would begin with 1949. And maybe a few years ago, I would have begot, begun with the Qing dynasty as we did today. But I think you know, 1949 really was a big transition. This was not a, a territory that had been closely governed by Beijing or by the Guomindang uh, since, since the collapse of the Qing, right? There'd been about 30 years with other powers there, uh, local groups, Russia was very involved in the Soviet Union and so on. So it was kind of a tabula rasa when the, when the PLA and the, the uh, CCP took over. And as I just said, they implemented this uh, sort of pluralistic Chinese, pluralism with Chinese characteristics approach uh, to it. Uh, real power always lay in the hands of the party. 
and, and so I think what really began there then was a process of, of populating the territory with Han Chinese uh, through deliberate uh, measures of settlement and really colonial or settler colonialism was a big part of it. We've, we've shied away from this word colonialism in the China fields talking about these territories. I don't think we should um, anymore. Obviously, from the academic point of view, it's a theoretical morass. What do you mean by colonialism? We're talking about psychological colonialism, colonialism settler colonialism. Um, but I think just it, from just a simple, simply looking at what's going on, both in terms of settlement and then also in terms of the pattern of development that has been followed uh, by the PRC, mainly stressing developing those industries, developing transport, developing agriculture in a way that benefits the center, benefits the metropole, and encourages the um, increased settlement of the region, the Han Chinese, particularly through the institution of the, the Bing Chuan or the, the uh, Xinjiang Production Construction Corps. Uh, so that's the 49 piece. And I think this is what the authorities in China you know, won't recognize. They won't consider this aspect of it because they're tied into the narrative that um, you know, Xinjiang has been part of China since ancient times. Again, thinking of China as everything since the Han Dynasty or, or before. But if you really look at what's happened since 49, you can see this pattern of development which has served to, to underdevelop, particularly southern Xinjiang, and has not really helped local indigenous people enough. So that's 49. I won't go through the whole, the whole history of the 20th century, but to get closer to, to your question, uh, 2009, you mentioned the you know, Urumqi riots, very, very famous. Uh, I think it's important when we talk about them to remember the events just a few days before. So it was, it was the 5th of July in 2009 when the events broke out in Urumqi, but it was the 26th of June that there had been a, a very violent incident in a toy factory in Guangdong where Uyghur guest workers in a dorm were attacked by Han workers from that same dorm. Uh, and it was a false accusation of an assault on a Han woman, which led to this, and it led to the murder of at least two Uyghur men. So it really was kind of a lynching sort of a situation. And there was, there was fear that it was being covered up by authorities, which led to this, to a, to a uh, big demonstration and protest march uh, in Urumqi. And it was the repression of that march, which then went violent. And there may have been other aspects and so on, but um, that led to violence against Han. But then the police suppression of that all through the night of the 5th of July involved live ammunition fire. And one point, it's, it, it's interesting thinking about you know, all of these dates with nines, right? Um, so 1989, you know, Tiananmen, it was, I don't know how, how many, was it a month or, or more than a month that students occupied the square? And eventually, of course, the repression was violent. Um, 2019, another nine last year, the Hong Kong protests and demonstrations went on. And you know, there was violence involved in that repression, but uh, not as much lethal violence. What's interesting about Xinjiang in this case was that the lethal force was used right away. And, and that says something about how Xinjiang is treated as, in a state of exception by, by CCP authorities. Uh, so in any case, that was a major watershed. Uh, it's not a terrorist event, but it was a, a violent event that I think sees the beginning of, of, of two trends which have merged together uh, recently. Uh, one of those was a trend of increasingly assimilative policies towards religion in particular, but also other aspects of Uyghur culture. Language, more pressure from the state to use Uyghur language in uh, less in public settings, move it out of the educational system. Uh, and of course, anti-veiling campaigns, um, campaigns against beards, fasting at Ramadan, that kind of thing, which began as campaigns, as discouragement, as regulations prohibiting party members and students from this kind of cultural and religious expression. But have now, 
now, as we've seen in recent years, have turned into actual uh, laws and, and illegalization of that kind of, uh, that kind of behavior. So, so those assimilative policies began then. And it was around that time that old Kashgar was also torn down and old Khotan was torn down. The other policy trend uh, is a different form of investment through what's known as the Partnership Assistance Program. And that is a kind of sister city plan which, which hooks up Chinese provinces, Eastern Chinese provinces and rich cities with a counterpart in Xinjiang. Uh, so for example, um, Shenzhen is linked to Kashgar and so on. Uh, and and these, these richer municipalities and provinces are mandated to spend a small percentage of their annual income as investments in developing Xinjiang uh, or their, their counterpart. It's an interesting idea and it's different from the you know, completely centralized Beijing throwing money at the situation. Uh, and it was an attempt to, I think, a, 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 a good faith attempt initially to address some of the problems of economic inequities uh, and inequalities and, and, and slow development in particularly southern Xinjiang, which was seen as a possible cause for the unrest in 2009. But what happened was the idea, even though it had this innovative component of, of you know, mobilizing the economic know-how of all of these successful cities, the problem is if you're in the Pearl River Delta or you know, East China, coastal, one of these very productive places, uh, uh, that's a very different situation be than being in Central Asia, right? And, there's a lot more foreign investment pouring in, and in many ways, it's a, it's a different situation. Uh, so what happened was it was this development was still kind of top down, and it tended it built industrial parks, uh, commercial zones, the the Kashgar special economic zone modeled after Shenzhen, things like that. And it was in those years after 2008 when China was uh, encouraging lots of investment in building and construction as a way to stimulate the economy uh, in the, during the global recession. So it resulted in a lot of overbuilding of, of factories, of commercial zones, in a place where it wasn't necessarily a good fit for what local economy needed. All right, another timeline then would be, or another kind of watershed moment, uh, would be 2013, 2014. And that's when we really saw the first time uh, clearly sort of jihadi kind of tactics being used. Um, I use that word, uh, or terrorism, that most people would recognize as terrorism. And, and um, by which I mean attacks on random civilians to make some kind of a political point. Um, what I don't mean is uh, evidence of large scale organization or evidence certainly of international involvement of some group outside that was causing these. And I'm referring to the, the Kunming knifings and there was um, an attack on a marketplace in Urumqi. There was also the vehicular assault in Tiananmen Square, people may remember. That may have been as much a self-immolation as it was an attack. But in any case, these really did have that, the, the, the tactical characteristics of, of a jihadi attack. And, and that certainly did uh, alarm authorities. It obviously was a, uh, a serious problem for the Xinjiang authorities to have that breaking out. And of course, it was happening in the, you know, in sort of the global context uh, as uh, ISIS was rising in, in, in Syria and so on. And so I think that's kind of the immediate proximate cause for the severe and uh, expansive and really indiscriminate crackdown that has happened since 2016, 2017, uh, which again, your viewers will know about the internment camps, uh, the, the ramped up birth suppression, uh, forced labor, and the idea that, that religious thought is extremism is a thought virus that needs to be uh, expunged from the entire population uh, through these coercive re-education methods or educational transformation methods. So, 
I didn't give you a clear answer to that, but um, you can see there's several points along the way. And I think the main thing is this kind of convergence of, of failed or partially failed development uh, with this assimilationist approach. And to just finally show how that convergence works, what's happened as people have been moved out of the internment camps since 2019 is that they have been put and in many cases forced to work in those very factories which were built or overbuilt by the partnership assistance program. And, and this is why we have a situation now where so many hundreds of companies, Chinese companies and foreign companies, as well as these provinces and cities of Eastern China are wrapped up in the entire system of repression in Xinjiang uh, because it's their factories that people are working in now. They're working with local authorities that have built the camps and the prisons. They're working with the Bing Chuan, which is also building camps and prisons and is economically uh, connected with, with many, many global corporations. To sort of wrap things up, I wanted to ask you a question directly related to what has been happening in Xinjiang, these sort of assimilationist policies, news about forced labor, all of that has generated a great deal of concern in the United States and elsewhere in the English speaking world. And it's also been appropriated as a cause by politicians within the United States. Um, and they have publicized it and made public statements about it. What I'd like to ask you is what you think people outside of China can do to most effectively assist in improving the situation in, in Xinjiang? So obviously this, the, the issue, particularly with regard to the US and US role is made very complicated by the Trump administration with its chaotic and kind of schizophrenic approach to China generally. And um, as we know from, uh, from John Bolton's memoir, and then also from Trump's own interview with Mr. Swan, um, that he deliberately did nothing about the Xinjiang atrocities at the administration level uh, for over a year because he was afraid that any action about that would undermine the trade deal that he was trying to achieve. Right. So that on the one hand, and, and you know, we have his uh, Bolton's comment that he basically green lighted the camps in conversations with Xi Jinping. Now, of course, it's a completely different story. China bashing is a, is a fundamental part of the Trump administration's reelection strategy. Uh, we're getting um, kind of a sequence of provocations about China from the administration, you know, almost a new one every week, closing consulates, uh, great scrutiny of universities and Chinese scholars and, and so on. So the difficult thing for people who are thinking about this is, uh, is not to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. If you, if you criticize this excessive China bashing and, and clearly politicized uh, use of the China issue by the Trump administration, which you know, we know doesn't really care about human rights itself. Um, not to, to be able to distinguish policies towards uh, sanctioning what, what the CCP is doing in Xinjiang and for, to a certain extent Hong Kong as well, uh, to distinguish that from the big basket of all the other things that, that the Trump administration is doing uh, towards, towards China. Um, so the first thing then is to you know, be aware of that. And I think there is a real, there's a clear difference just if you look at the policies. Um, US now has the Weaker Human Rights Policy Act, Global Magnitsky, various tools which allow for targeted sanctions on officials, on, uh, on, on corporate heads, on, on, on businesses and so on um, that are involved. And these are very important symbolically, but also materially. Um, so one thing that, that people can do uh, is, and I, and I think some of our best levers are not going to be through you know, governor officials like Pompeo or senators like, like Cruz and Rubio, you know, wagging their finger at China, but they're going to be through commercial channels, through, through the economic uh, levers, 
And so one of the things that people can do is to be aware and to communicate your concern uh, you know, with businesses about their supply chains. And we've had some cases of, of companies whose, uh, whose suppliers have been directly, you know, material and, and, and apparel have been directly made by Uyghurs under coercive circumstances in factories. That's one level. But then there are also less direct connections, suppliers of suppliers, um, Uyghurs working in China, Uyghurs working in Xinjiang. Uh, and it gets tricky there, but the uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute has a big report and they've you know, found 82 foreign country companies that are directly or indirectly involved. Um, we don't have time to sort of go into all the ways in which this sort of indirect involvement can take place, but um, just very, very quickly, Xinjiang grows 80% uh, of China's cotton, and a lot of that cotton is grown by the Bingtuan, which also wrote, uh, has prisons and, and, and camps. Um, and China makes something like 20 to 25% of the world's cotton in addition to all the clothes. So the thing is the cotton gets into almost everything, even if the company itself is based somewhere, somewhere else. So it's a long story. It's complicated. It's not as simple as saying, oh, we need to boycott this company, boycott that company, because it's really too big of a mess for that. Uh, but to really communicate your concern through these companies, uh, you know, following up with them, tweeting about them, uh, asking uh, for information on where they're getting things. The, the um, Muji had a, had a Xinjiang cotton uh, shirt line as recently as a year ago, and you could see it in the stores, Xinjiang, Xinjiang cotton. You know, they got the message quite quickly that that was not a good thing. Whether they're supplying differently or not, we don't know, but certainly this is a signal that will be sent through the supply chains back up to Chinese firms and ultimately to Xinjiang as well, that they cannot continue these kind of practices and hope for, and, and not taint really all of, you know, a very, very broad sector of China's apparel industry and also electronics and, and assembly and that kind of thing. So that's the kind of direct sort of thing. Um, and of course, this young woman, um, what's her name, uh, Feroza Aziz, who, uh, a while ago did a, uh, a TikTok video uh, of her curling her eyelashes and talking about what's going on. That kind of use of social media, which young people do so well uh, and, and understand so well is, is very important. Likewise, the Arsenal football player in Britain has really done a lot and to get this message about. So that's what I'd say. Um, and then I guess at a, at a broader level, you know, it's not direct action, but I think it is very important to learn about Uyghurs, to learn about Central Asian culture, uh, and, and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz. It's not simply Uyghurs, but these other you know, indigenous peoples of the regions. Listen to their music, uh, go to restaurants. There are now Uyghur restaurants really in many, many places in the United States and in Europe, elsewhere, and you know, enjoy the food. Um, if you can, study the language. You know, it's a way of showing support uh, it's very meaningful to Uyghur people in diaspora and anywhere uh, if others are trying to learn their language. And it's a great language. It's, a, it's kind of a, a key to the whole family of Turkic languages and Al Al Altaic languages, so it's actually very useful. Um, and it's a way of you know, preserving or at least supporting you know, Uyghur culture. And ultimately, I think, you know, as more people outside of China are aware of Uyghurs and show this appreciation for it, well, maybe some of that will also signal back to China, which has forgotten about appreciating and celebrating Uyghur culture and has been trying to sort of suppress it. And so uh, I think those are actually very important things. And that, of course, is also you know, eating food, listening to music, and, and learning a language is also fun. And it's a way mm -hmm. to Uyghur people. So I would recommend that people do that. That's great. So, Jim, uh, you know, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to, to have this conversation. I've found it you know, nothing short of enlightening. I mean, the amount of knowledge and expertise you have on all of these topics is just amazingly impressive. And I think that the one thing that the conversation did was really drive home the importance of understanding the history behind all of these headlines that we see related to Xinjiang or, 
any other part of China because I think that you can't really parse through all of that complexity and the um, different levels to all of these uh, concerns without understanding that historical background. So, um, you know, it's been really a as a fellow historian, right, as a fellow, right. fellow historian, I agree with that entirely. Yeah. Absolutely. But I mean, I think that you made that absolutely clear. And I really uh, thank you again for taking the time to, to talk to us today. Well, again, thanks for having me on and giving me the opportunity.